Kevin? Uh, nothing at this time. Noah? Anything from the students? Shout out to Heidi for putting together the student council uh, voting today, and the um, the class councils were officially released today. So shout out to the whole office. Great. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge all who helped and attended uh, last night's forum for a strategic plan stakeholder input session from the food service staff, Ben, Lori, and Carlene, who did an amazing job um, with the dinner provided and even uh, offered some leftover brownies for us tonight, uh, to the students who, uh, and Ms. Goodall, who um, made childcare possible, which allowed um, many to attend and be able to have childcare. So uh, thanks to, to Ms. Goodall for coordinating that and for the students who, um, volunteered their time for Jason tech setup and Bill helping with the facility setup and then Brian and members of the team for facilitating that evening. And uh, we had a great turnout. So for all who attended and took their time to you know, come out on, a, on kind of a dreary evening to that event, much appreciated. Great. And I'm just reading off the agenda that there's a acknowledgement of a grant from Terry Lynch in memory of Vicki Lynch to the ASA library of $250 which is very generous and appreciated. All right, we'll go on to director reports. Lisa? Um, I've just been super impressed with how uh, our staff has done in terms of programming for kids. We started out the year short staff and kind of looking at how we're gonna cover the needs, especially of our younger learners. And uh, you know, we did quickly reached out to some experienced substitutes that really made the difference in uh, just helping us progress through the day and, and providing very much needed support. Uh, we've had many transfer meetings and new students. I've uh, been happy to welcome these new families to Orono. It's been really, really nice that we're definitely having more meetings in person and, and able to meet new families that way. Um, we had several late referrals last spring, so we're just meeting now with teams to review those evaluations and make determinations uh, based on the results. Uh, every day we're working on reducing ed tech openings to best support student needs. Uh, we've been very fortunate, like I said, to, to have the substitutes we've had, but we're just kind of waiting on, on state approval for um, ed tech certification and be able to get their their fingerprints done and you know we've got we've got some folks in the pipeline that we're very excited about and, and looking forward to bringing on board i think we're still short for staff um so i think we're doing very well uh mll teachers have been very busy with um WIDA testing you know several students in each school 13 students total that are receiving direct services seven that uh, continue to be monitored uh, Rose Pompey, our MLL teacher, is working with families to develop student individualized language acquisition plans. So um, it's very, uh, it's she's she's very excited to meet with families. Families are excited to meet with her, and it's nice to see, um, you know, how much communication is happening with with our folks that are uh, multiple multiple language learners. And, and like I said, we have, there are several that represent several languages and, and it just astounds me, um, you know, right to our regular ed staff, you know, doing what they need to do to, to help these, these folks just learn and, and get by in the classroom. Um, that's it for director's report, if you have any questions. That's great, thank you, any questions? Can I just take a quick check if people online are hearing us okay? There's like a 10 second lag on the video, which is kind of disturbing, but we can probably live with that if people online are hearing us okay. Yeah, probably not. yeah listen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and proceed. Um, so, Susan. So there is um, a lot going on in the world of curriculum and professional development right now. We had our first curriculum um, committee meeting last Thursday, and I'll just add that um, on my board report, I put a couple of our long-term goals, and after our discussion on Thursday, we added um, 
the word um, that leads to high student growth and achievement, not just high student achievement. So that, that change has already been made somewhat. Um, in order to not just document what we're already doing in the land of curriculum, but really to collaborate and learn together, we um, come up with a timeline that I think will end with something that will really be thoughtful and help transform some of our instruction. Um, but does mean we're going to take a little bit more time probably than what we originally sort of had laid out in a four-year type of cycle. So we're still on track and I'm planning to bring the instructional technology um, scope and sequence and um, give statements back to the board in November, as well as math curriculum from kindergarten up through high school geometry. And we're um, just starting to solicit feedback again from stakeholders on that. Um, you know, Information is going out um, over probably the weekend through the Oracle and the week in preview and Rachel putting things online. And um, one of the things we'll be having is a dessert and discussion at the ACES school at um, on October 3rd at 6.30. And I, um, my elementary teacher background is, is coming into play here. I have to envision that as centers in the ASA cafeteria where people can go and have a, a conversation, look at some documents and get some feedback. Um, in the areas that interest them the most. So um, Kelly Dill, Brad Martin, uh, Deb Seiber, Shauna Goodall, Margie Innes, and Heather Holmes are all helping on that evening. So appreciate that their um, willingness to, to give the time to, to interface with folks. So um, please spread the word and help us spread the word for October 3rd. Um, then um, we have a, a two-year plan for other curriculum work that would include K-12 physical education, K-12 Visual and Performing Arts, K-12 World Language, and chances for those folks to collaborate and work together and um, give each other feedback on, on the documents in the process, as well as K-8 English Language Arts. And there are a lot of strands to English Language Arts when you think about the reading, writing, listening, speaking, phonics pieces. So I, I think to do that justice, it will take a while. And we know that we're going to need to look at some different resources, particularly at the elementary school for, for reading and writing instruction as well. Um, and then in grades nine and 10, working um, Meredith and Jeff Owen and other teachers are really interested in taking a look and transforming the ninth grade experience to be more of a place-based, community-based um, and community building type of <coughs> set of courses where they could really look at the Penobscot River in this area, probably the physical piece of the river in the ninth grade here, and then the, the people and the culture around the Penobscot River more in, in the bio biology of the night of the Penobscot River in 10th grade. So um, field trip is planned for tel uh, September 28th to Telmark High School, Telstar, sorry, thanks, Telstar High School in, in um, Bethel over that direction because their ninth grade class does a lot of community-based learning and we'd like to, to learn from them. So um, social studies, science, and English language arts teachers will be working together to, to really think about what that experience will look like and be like for our ninth and tenth grade kids. Um, that we were all really start in earnest um, during some uh, a couple hours during the professional development time on October 6th. And then also on October 6th, um, we'll be having um, Connie Carter is going to come and let our staff know a little bit more about Americans to Tell the Truth. And we have a, a project lined up in partnership with the Orono Public Library, where we will be having Robert Shetterly come to the school and also do a community event in the evening. Um, and portraits of truth tellers that have been selected by our students in the Environmental Club and the Civil Rights Club and the GSA um, group at, at OMS um, will be uh, throughout the school, but also throughout the town for approximately a month this fall. Um, and we're really um, picturing and, and thinking that there are a lot of different avenues and resources. There's um, Speaking Truth to Youth and some other programs through Americans Who Tell the Truth with lots of great educational options and, and resources. And we know some teachers are interested in working on the Samantha Smith Project, which is research truth tellers and, and do um, an art project to, of some sort to help convey, um, could be a portrait, but it could also be a poem or song or things. So, um, thinking that throughout the year we'll have quite a few different um, projects happening in, in the classrooms and in the buildings, but wanting to showcase that together with the community again in the spring. So um, we're pretty excited about the, the options that that might uh, 
spark for our kids um, and our and our teachers. And then um, I think Kevin commented that I brought quite a few books. <laughs> so we have um, five different book studies that are happening throughout the year. Um, all the ed tech teachers and administrators have chosen one of these five books and we'll meet at least three times during our professional development days to dig into them and discuss them. They're all related um, to different aspects of our DEI work. Um, a couple particularly focus around um, socioeconomic status and poverty as well as, as trauma. So there's um, teaching with poverty and equity in mind and from a responsive schooling. Um, so about 30 people have signed up for each of these two books and another 30 for um, Unearthing Joy by uh, Goldie Muhammad. So those are our, our biggest groups by far, but um, we have teacher leaders that have um, kindly, graciously accepted the, the invitation to facilitate those books. So um, the, the um, Unearthing Joy is going to be Suzanne, the bell. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Suzanne Navell and Kim O oh are going to um, facilitate that book. Um, DJ Bowden and KC Eads are going to do the trauma responsive schooling. Um, Amy Hart and Jessica Archer are going to facilitate poverty and equity in mind. And um, Katie Cork and Jen Patil are doing grading for equity. We have about 10 folks that have signed up for this book. Um, it's been a book study that was done in the past year, so we're not surprised that that number is smaller. And then about 15 people have signed up for the gatherings, which is about um, settler and indigenous or col col colonial and indigenous culture and really focuses on the, the Wabanaki um, community. A lot's going on October 6th. And then um, the last part of my report is really about the NWA testing. I think we've talked a lot about that tonight already, but just uh, as Meredith had mentioned, we are um, putting our students and entering our students into both platforms that cater for the main testing, as well as the regular NWA map growth test. And that takes a lot of work and involves a lot of people. So there's a lot of moving parts there. And I really appreciate everybody from the, the school secretaries and Lynn who helped make sure that the kids get injured right in the power school. So it can go to Synergy, so it can go to Acacia and um, our IT department for uploading from power school straight to, to NWA. And, uh, principles for setting up schedules and figuring out who's going to proctor what and all sorts of things. Thank them for, for doing that. Great. Thank you. Any questions? The reading groups is cool. So this is the first time you've had the whole staff involved? I guess I've been here. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Since I've been here. Yeah. Give it a try. Yeah, nice. I think it, it'll be nice when we get together and have curriculum work, you know, at, because I think different people will bring some different learning from the different studies. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Go ahead and move on to the student report. A lot has happened in 13 days. Um, <laughs> we'll start with school culture. The senior yearbook forms have been sent out and are due on the 30th of October. The yard sale fundraiser is this Saturday after we postponed the storm. The class of 2024 has started their cookie dough fundraiser. Picture day is on October 12th. The NHS and NAHS are having a joint fundraiser selling flower bulbs. Um, NHS is having candidate meetings throughout this, this week and next week. Um, we listed a bunch of the meeting dates that I'll come up to. Like, <laughs> you <laughs> probably are to find the NHS. Uh, the Secret Garden Club held their first meeting this morning. Voting for student council officers began today. The GSA held their first meeting this week. Environmental Club is starting strong and has the compost bins up and running. Enclave held their first meeting this week. Math team is looking for more members. Ciela Tulip Project is having a meeting tomorrow during Win Win. We are holding a children's book drive in the lobby who donated to welcoming immigrant neighbors. And the SPC had their chili dinner last night. And that was a great success uh, with a good turnout and great community contributions. As for academics, the first couple week, weeks of classes were swimmingly. Mid-quarter grade check-ins are coming up. SAT sign-ups for the November 4th test date close on uh, October 5th. ASA has an open house this Thursday. Graduation for distinction is required meeting day next Tuesday, October, uh, yeah, October 26th. No, it's September. September. <laughs> uh, and the fall DWD P5 proposals are due Monday, October 9th. 
As for activities, the home homecoming dance is coming up on October fifth. Jazz band auditions on the twenty sixth of September. Um, mean Girls rehearsal started yesterday. Congratu congratulations to everyone in the cast and the crew member meeting is this Friday. And all of our sports teams are having a great and very interesting start to seasons and are being super flexible with the weather we've been having. That's it. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments? Hopefully you survive the heat until May anyway. Yeah, hopefully. Anything else? All right, thank you. And we'll come back. We've got another discussion with the student reps later. Amira's superintendent's report. There are a couple of items listed, and I'm just going to mention those first, and then I have several other items. The legislative update I put in your um, in the board folder came a couple of weeks ago from MSMA. It is a comprehensive listing of all of the um, legislation that occurred that impacts schools. Uh, from the last session and even less bills that were carried over um, and uh, the time frame for those. Um, I learned some things from reading this that didn't reach my radar last spring about some new legislation. Uh, tomorrow, Brian and I are going to the annual legislative seminar that we um, usually come back with a whole list of policy work that we need to do and other you know communication and, and uh, discussion we need to have around legislative changes but i wanted to give you this as a preview um of that when when brian and i come back from that usually we give a summary report to the board at a subsequent board meeting so you'll hear more class about our takeaways on um any work we need to do locally to respond to um what has um what, what's in this packet and what we learn tomorrow um, additionally, I put in the board folder the um, information about the MSMA fall conference that's at the end of October. Um, it's on October 27th and or 26th and 27th in Augusta. It's a Thursday and Friday. And um, I hope, you know, take a look. I hope any board member that's willing and interested, um, we could be happy to support that registration, whether it's for one day, both day, if you can only come down part of a day. Um, we try to uh, carpool as much as schedules permit. Sometimes, you know, Brian has to come down late because of teaching uh, duties and such. So um, I'm, I'm definitely going for both days. I think Brian's going for some of the time. More than I have to. Yeah. Um, the keynote speaker this year is a great speaker. I've heard him speak multiple times, and he's a you know really well known speaker who's really future forward thinking. And so I always enjoy um, and get a lot of, out of listening to his keynotes. Um, but mainly the the real value in this conference is in the breakout sessions. There's just a lot of variety. And so I gave you a paper that shows the um, clinics, the breakout clinic uh, topics. Um, so you can see the, the variety of um, you know, session offerings to help you um, consider this conference. Um, I think the reg registration deadline is over in October, so I will check in again with you um, at the next board meeting to see if we can take a head count of who's interested in going. Um, in addition to that, I just want to celebrate that we signed the, um, we're officially under contract with Nickerson O'Day for the central office project as of today. So as of the, to, the clock starts today, 180 days to finish the project. So that feels like a real milestone that we've, um, we've crossed over. Um, they're eager to, to get started, but um, today was just a free construction meeting. So they need to line some things up and, and we also need to finish getting some things out of there after the yard sale on Saturday. And so we told them it'll be ready as of you know early next week. Um, I realized today that this was the meeting that I usually bring you a class size update. I don't have that. I will have it for you the next meeting. What I can tell you in my quick review today is uh, data is still being cleaned up in, um, in power school a bit as we begin cleaning things up with Students who we we've learned have have moved away, and it maybe was a surprise to us they moved away, and so they they hang out in power school for a bit until we get another board request. So that will be cleaned up by the time we have our next board meeting. But what I can tell you is that 
um, we have had come students coming to us and students leaving and um, class sizes are at a point where I, you know, don't, I feel like our staffing is right where it needs to be. And that's usually the check-in we do at this point. Um, you know, in particular, what's interesting is in one grade at ASA, I think we've had eight or nine come in, but we've also had five or six leave. And so it's a net change of three. Um, whereas, um, you know, when you hear we had nine new first graders come in, it's like, oh no, how are we managing that? But we also had, I think six must have left because it's in, in that change of five from where it was in um, in August when we pulled the numbers to show you at the end of August. So that, that's probably the, the grade level that at least the digging I could do that has had the biggest coming and going at ASA in particular. Um, and all the other grade levels um, are in the neighborhood of where they were. There's high, some high school anomalies that we're still sorting out in terms of when I look back at the August, late August numbers to where they are now. Um, but class sizes, you know, don't appear to be out of whack with, you know, what we would need for staffing there. Um, so again, we'll bring that that report um, the next meeting. I mentioned in the acknowledgments about strategic plan uh, meeting we had last night. So just you know, for the benefit of everyone, uh, to recap where we are, um, our small committee who has been working on soliciting this uh, stakeholder stakeholder input um, part of the work is meeting late next, this week or on Friday, actually, to um, synthesize all of that, hopefully into a survey that we can send out to stakeholders so that all of the stakeholder input that we've received can be um, synthesized into a survey so that we can then get even more broad um, feedback um, for the strategic planning leadership team to, to use in, as they kind of roll up the sleeves and really begin drafting a plan. So um, the committee is meeting later in October and that's to give us time to actually get the survey developed, get it out, um, give people time to respond to it and then have some results to share with the um, leadership team. So that's where we are in that process and uh, you'll see a survey coming out in the nearest future. Um, I also wanted to update on uh, staffing. We um, have a, a new retirement to announce. Um, Janice Paulson has worked for our district for, this is her 35th year, and Janice has decided to retire. Janice has worked in food service for many years for us. Um, and so we want to acknowledge and congratulate her and, and, and appreciate those years of service. Um, so we do have a new vacancy in food service. We actually already had another one. We had just been advertising um, in anticipation of as we transition to using uh, reusable um, uh, serveware up here at the high school. We'll need more dishwasher support at the high school. So we already had a position being advertised. So now we'll have two open openings. Um, so for now, um, Ben has moved a staff member from the high school kitchen down to ASA and Ben is um, you know, filling in and kind of doing double duty in the high school kitchen to assist um, Suzanne, the kitchen manager with the high, middle high school. Um, we also are still looking for a van driver. <laughs> Get the word out. Um, super flexible. Anyone who wants to work any part of it, we are willing to uh, work with them. Um, also, at text, everyone that walks through the door, at least at a cost in the central <laughs> office, to say, hey, we, we want to be an at tech. I, a cost was the wrong word. Uh, approaches. Uh, invitationally. <laughs> say, Hello. Would you like to be an at tech? Um, but also, you know, we're ongoing looking for custodians. Thankfully, we feel like we have a great relationship with our contracted provider that helps us fill those gaps. But we have openings advertised there as well. So still looking for personnel and, you know, a couple of new ones with the food service advertisement. So um, if you know folks, please send them our way. Those are all the things I wanted to mention tonight. Do you have any questions? 
I would just add on the conference, it's definitely worthwhile to go down for two or three sessions, which is two or three hours. Doesn't have to be a two day, full day commitment. So those, like Marita said, those, uh, you know, the clinics are all quite interesting. I also just find it super interesting to talk to other superintendents and board members, especially board members from around the state. And, you know, most of these clinics have small group discussion kinds of things and just kind of hear what's happening around the rest of the state and how our district is, uh, you know, different and the same and how different people are dealing with different uh, challenges and things like that. So definitely put a plug in for it. Anything else? All right, we'll go ahead and move on to discussion items. So uh, first up is the data workshop. We didn't really get a chance to properly thank everybody for putting that together. Uh, I know that represents a lot of work and I, I've said this several years running, but it continues to be true and more true is I really appreciate the culture change that's happened in this district. When we started this seven eight years ago, it felt like the board was the only people looking at the data which was not a healthy place to be. And it put the board in an awkward position of asking questions that probably, you know, weren't great questions at a board meeting. And it's really changed the culture to a point where it's like, you guys are coming to us, you process the data, the teachers have processed the data, these questions are already being talked about. And it's kind of like the board's role is just to give attention to make sure that we keep paying attention to it. So it's been a real culture change that I think is really exciting and really healthy and productive to see. So. A lot of gratitude and appreciation for that. That said, we didn't really get a whole lot of time to discuss um, what we saw. So the floor is kind of open for that discussion. I mean, the quick recap, I think for people who maybe didn't um, see the data discussion is we're in the middle of a test change. The state of Maine has, it's kind of awkward. They didn't completely change the test, but they sort of did a modified version of the test we've been using for a long time. And so there's all sorts of questions about whether the test scores are or are not comparable. And they mostly seem like they're comparable, except they don't seem comparable for 10th grade, uh, which has some really weird results in 10th grade. That said, you know, we, we show the same general pattern of uh, above average achievement and probably more average growth uh, compared to national norms. And, um, you know, and I, I think increasingly we're all looking at growth. Looks like even we is putting growth forward more in their reports. Um, just the fact that they had the growth bars next to the achievement bars is something new. So, um, and, you know, and the other thing is there's a COVID effect and it's quite surprisingly, it seems like at least nationally, uh, it seems like the effect is not like decaying through time. It's actually increasing through time, if anything. Uh, so those are things that we're grappling with. Uh, that's a very quick high-level summary, and anybody else is welcome to jump in, but I think those were some of the things we saw. We saw, trying to think, a bunch of school-level data. At, at the high school, we saw some data on um, graduation rates and AP classes and where students are going. I mean, I personally didn't see the um, shift to where students are going. It, it, there's a big change, right? We talked about the two-year versus four-year, and also the workforce versus two-year or four-year. To me, that's like students making rational choices based, in, based on income and cost landscapes. And um, But the graduation rate, I know, is a concern, and I know it's a COVID consequence, but that certainly seems like something, you know, that still sticks out as a, a concern. Um, I don't know what did other, and I know there's already lots of reflection and thoughts of, about uh, this. Anybody else on the board? Uh, and that certainly includes the students. Have thoughts or comments? I wanted to dig into more of it since we really didn't get a lot of time for discussion. Can we talk about the AP stuff? You, yeah, anything. Go for it. <laughs> I just, if we wanted to focus on test scores specifically, I would keep my thoughts to myself. <laughs> um, yeah, um, as a student who is, let's say, well connected in those who take AP classes, <laughs> um, I was surprised to hear that our teachers think we're making choices uh, that benefit our mental health. 
specifically for benefiting our mental health, I suppose. Um, I know personally, I'm only taking two AP classes this year. Um, and part of that is because I, I don't think I'm qualified to take AP Calc. Um, but also on the grounds of like, those are the classes that fit into my schedule, not necessarily for my mental health. And I know a lot of the kids in the AP classes with me or in different AP classes are not feeling super great um, emotionally in reference to that, I guess. I feel like I'm not being articulate. For, for lack of a better term, a lot of the kids who are taking many AP classes are sort of like, a mess. <laughs> for lack of a better term, we're um, thirteen days in. We're yeah, like, I know. I know some kids who are just like chronic overachievers, um, who are taking four APs currently, and they just like it's like APs and extracurriculars and clubs mm -hmm. and like they're they're like they have games like every day, every other day, mm -hmm. and they're just like they're not they're not taking their own like like well being into account. They're also like, not sleeping. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. no, they're not. Um. So they just like for them like the most important part is just like the fact that they're like doing this and like it will be worth it like that's like a big thing that I hear all the time like yeah. you know like right now I might not be feeling good but like at the end of the day it's gonna be worth it mm -hmm. but like what about now like you, like at this rate you're not gonna make it to the point where like it's gonna be worth it like, because you're so burnt out already like mm -hmm. it's literally two weeks into school and you're like you're like you're already like falling behind um I just. Like, I'm I'm glad that our teachers think that we we're not doing this with mental health. But I think someone else yes, is doing better. Some kids, mm -hmm. but it's just. Well, I mean, so mathematically, there are or the average student who's taken AP classes has taken fewer than they did in previous years. And I think that was the speculation, right, right? That that was because of mental health, but that doesn't mean that there's not more progress to be made in that choice, right? And also, some kids who. Uh, aren't taking APs this year have switched to taking college courses instead. Right. Or just in mm -hmm. yeah. That's the thing that happened to me is I signed up for way more APs than I'm taking because I tried to justify myself. It's my senior year. I can do it. It's my last year. I got it. And it just didn't fit into my schedule. Um, or one time I did go to guidance and Heidi was like, maybe not. Uh, which, you know, good call for her. Uh, it's just I found it interesting and I would love to hear more about that perspective of uh, adult educators uh, versus what I hear and so Yeah, is. and we'll also um, discuss like the overachieving kind of aspect in our presentation. In our presentation. So, <laughs> precursor to that. Great. Um, so the, um, the, the teacher who shared the, um, the anecdote in the meeting about students being more strategic essentially about which APs they're taking you know that was that was a conversation with one student about their choices and that you know goes alongside the um the fact that we do have a reduction in the number of AP, the average number of APs that you know students are taking um, alongside increased enrollment in early college um, but actually not at a rate that absorbs that reduction in AP courses, um, you know, so there is an increase in early college, but not, not at the same rate. Um, but I think that one of the, you know, there are so many different frames that schools can use to talk about how to advise students as they're in, in the launch years, right? That 11th to 12th grade, thinking about what comes next. And something that we talked about in the AP community of practice is that we haven't really done a good job of, of characterizing what the role of AP is in this building. Uh, which may feel like the natural reality because it's the one in which we're all living, but at the same time, it's actually a very specific version of the role that AP plays. You know, there are districts where if you want to take an AP class, you need to have taken these prerequisites or you're not eligible. There are, are districts where you need to take a, um, a screening test and then are advised to either take it or not take it depending on the results of the screening. Our approach is unique in that it's challenge by choice, right? It's if you want this challenge, um, we want to support you in accepting that challenge um, we are going to provide you with resources, and if it proves to be too much, we want to give you an option to sort of off-ramp um, so that you can have the level of challenge that you feel like is appropriate for you. Um, and that is alongside the idea that 
and we keep coming back to again and again that we've been talking about, I want to say maybe for two years in this district, that students should be able to define what success is for them and then craft, or I think the phrase we've used on the, um, the DI leadership team is map their education to what that definition of success is, which is also can feel like the natural way of doing things and is actually pretty revolutionary in terms of thinking about education, especially if you you know look at a district where if you're taking English, you're either taking English 9, English 10, English 11, or English 12, right? Full stop. Um, we really want to remove barriers to students actualizing a plan forward and a plan for their own launch that puts them in the best place possible for the future that they hope to have for themselves. And sometimes that means confronting uh, what for some students is this assertion, I'm taking, I'm, I'm maxing myself out and you're going to sit there as my school counselor or my administrator or my advisor and support me while I max myself out because that's what I want to do. And that can be, that can be hard, um, especially when there is this sense of, oh, you know, like, is this really the is this really doable, right? Because sometimes that's the question is, is this even doable given the schedule that you have for yourself when it's coupled with whatever you're squeezing in before school, whatever you're squeezing in right after school, and then whatever you're squeezing in on the weekends and in, in the evenings. And, you know, as we, um, could you go to the slide that has the questions? Yeah. Um, you know, so when we presented this um, this data to our faculty, um, the the prompt at the end was, you know, to which question should this be leading us? I'm sure. sure. That's a great answer. Okay. Um, to, because the answers, we're not going to find the answers, right? We're never, the answers are never going to be there. But what we can do is look for what can we be asking in light of all of this that we have learned. And, um, you know, this... This is this is Susan Susan's um, graceful synthesis of a whole lot of questions into you know a, a series of categories, um, you know. But I I just want to underscore the, the one on the bottom right. How do we address the increased numbers to two year programs and direct to employment not as a problem, but rather as a reality that must be accommodated and provided for? How do we adapt our model and vision of public education to meet the needs of these students? Um, you know, reflects one part of the data, but then I think what you're both talking about, uh, Marissa and Dorsa, is the other part of that, which is students who are, even in the face of these many challenges, continuing to max themselves out, but sometimes because of the accessibility and virtual opportunities are doing it even more so, because now you don't want to need travel time to get from one place to another, you can just switch your screen. Um, and I think that this is, you know, as a, as a building and talking about this, this feels like, perhaps one of the bigger umbrella questions that we need to be addressing, like how do we support kids across this full spectrum? How do we have within the intimacy of a 370 student building, the resources and opportunities and uh, precision of, of instruction that allows for all of this to unfold? Um, and in the wake of that meeting with faculty, it felt good to hear so much of that echo across departments and across levels of seniority. Um, so I, I'll just throw in that I purposely made this slide look like this because there were about three questions from staff members that were around NWAs, three questions from staff members that were around staff morale, <laughs> and about 12 for each of those other two categories. So people were really thinking about how do we change our practices to help students and how do we educate ourselves more so we can uh, give good advice to students who are, who, are, who are thinking, do I do an AP class? Should I do an early college class? Should I, should I go to UTC? Can I do all of that? Um, that those are the um, really profound questions I felt as I read that people are really thinking um, some, some deep thoughts about what we can do to help support students. This brings up an interesting topic um, that we like discussed last night where um, we were talking about like some of our ambitions and like goals for like what our um like for values that our students will like actually hold and like like develop and one of them was like learning to accept um failure and learning to, like how to accept like just hearing no and like while that may sound drastic to like refer to like 
kids not being able to take more advanced classes is like failure but to, to, to them it is to me it is to like not be able to yeah. not be able to do that so like i feel like one major thing is just like at the end of the day like kids just need just need to be told no like if you if you give them the opportunity to take more classes they're going to take more classes it doesn't matter if they're falling behind it doesn't matter if they don't get sleep it doesn't matter to them about anything it's just like at the end of the day like so they just need to be told no and I think it's really interesting. You describe it as a challenge by choice that we like don't have a lot of those built-in mechanisms that stop certain students from taking certain things. Um, my process is through AP. I've always like all of our classes. If you're going to sign up for something, requires teacher approval. Um, and I've like never like I've, like Dorsey mentioned. I've never been told no. Like I I signed up for AP art two days into the school year and I said, Hey, if I get my summer work done by the end of the week, can I be in AP art? And she's like, Yeah, sure. And I did, and I did the thing, and now I have AP art in my schedule. But I had always I had never considered it as I never considered us a challenge by choice school, especially when a lot of students in higher ranking classes are challenged by force uh, from an outside party that's not like within our walls um it's it's not always up to a student whether or not they take an ap class or if somebody says to you well the next logical progression in your schedule is it's really hard to tell the adult who's giving you you know this data that you really don't need another class in your schedule um i know right before the school year starts every year uh, a whole bunch of kids get emails about why they shouldn't have a study hall and i know a lot of kids feel pressure in that to pick up another class um i just i guess i think it's important that we're told no but it's also important that we're allowed room to breathe um where i know the study halls thing has been a big deal the last couple of years in particular um and i know that sometimes it's good even if it's not productive i guess is i remember last year there was a board meeting discussion on why kids being non-productive in study halls means that that's non-productive time but i think it's just as productive to allow your brain to wander especially if you're um not getting that at a different time yeah like for me i some days i have two study halls some days i have one because of just timing with my college course but genuinely like the time that i use in my study hall while it may not necessarily be the most productive time is like, the only time that i have just like downtime in my entire day because like most days like i'm at school by like 7 7 30 and i don't leave until like 8 8 30 and i get done i'm doing homework like i don't get any downtime unless it's actually like in my blocked in study halls mm -hmm. so i have friends who schedule time to stare at a wall like time to just drift um which is not maybe the most healthy way to do that but there's also the implication of if you have a close family that family time that needs to happen that social aspect of that or some days i come home i've finished rehearsal i go home and then i'm gonna make dinner because my mom had to teach a college course, my dad had to do a late meeting, so I'll make dinner, that's fine. Then we'll have dinner, and then that, like the time, there's just never a right time to stop and do nothing. And I know um, my win-wins get rapidly filled up with, oh, you need help over here? Happy to do that. Oh yeah, we, we're having a meeting? That sounds super interesting, let's do that. Um, and just having that down kind of super important. Uh, I would love to hear uh, what your thoughts are on that, I suppose. Well, I think that, you know, listening to you reminds me actually of a conversation that our group had last night at the strategic planning, um, which both of which sort of occupy different points on the spectrum of, you know, what does it mean to prepare students for high school to actually live a successful and happy life, right? To be in a place where you can say, you know what, my days are full from 7 a.m. to 8 30 p.m. I have no downtime. Is that how I want it? Or could it be different? And if I decide I want it to look differently, what do I do? Over here versus then over here, our conversation last night involved um, the, the students for whom school has become the place that is most stable, 
most safe, um, where they can get the things that they need, like nutrition and dental care, and where um, teachers are relied on to not only be the conduits to you know content and instruction, but also um, the the safe and trusted adult. Sometimes the safe and trusted adult. Mm -hmm. And one of our responsibilities now, it feels like that's different than you know before the pandemic is um, simultaneously cultivating for you know folks who are opting into so many things that they're feeling overwhelmed, while also providing for students whose very basic needs need to come through the school, or they're not going to come, and if they don't come, then their kids are not going to be able to learn. And I think that when we are um, you know, when we had the student conversations earlier this week, as um, Ronco and I both ran a session for um, students in the August program. And in those sessions, um, we got Mercy, you were in my session. Uh, you know, we talked about that idea of, of having as part of our time in school, figure out what it is that we need, like what does our definition of, of success look like with respect to whether I have downtime, whether I'm challenging myself, whether I'm giving myself a break, how full my schedule is over the course of a day, who I'm listening to and not listening to, right? Because hearing you say, for some kids, it's not a choice. They're forced to take certain classes. And in my head, I'm thinking that is not the frame that we want students to be, you know, using when they're they're deciding what they're taking or not. So then what does it mean to have a conversation with a student who feels like, I mean, forced in these particular classes when the reality is that's not at all what, what we want to feel like the truth is um, and how do we support all of that? And um, no. the choice also, I love what you're saying. You guys made it sound like we appreciate the choice, but boundaries might be helpful. And, and you know, on, on the other end of that, I, I've been surprised since I've been here to see how many uh, high-flying students are referred for special education by teachers themselves or their parents because of the anxiety uh, that they're experiencing. Or what might look like at executive functioning where they have difficulty balancing their time or time management. But when you look at their schedules, like, no wonder, you know, that, that, that this is overwhelming. We're, some, we're one of the better schools in that regard. Right. I know I have friends um, in you know, different places and friends that I met at the conference we went to where they're like, oh yeah, it's totally fine. I've been at school uh, for 12 hours at this point and you know, I'm gonna be here for another five hours before I can go home and that is a normal regular day and tomorrow I get to be here for more hours than that. And I'm like, Lacey, you should go home uh, right now. <laughs> like the rest of your responsibilities need to be like eating a balanced meal and then taking a nap. And I think it's, it's hard when another student is that regulatory voice uh, I know I have friends who I've had to be that regulatory voice for. I have friends who work all the way through lunch or go to a practice room because they want to audition for something uh, and they like choose rather than having social time and eating time to have work time extra. Right? To rather than have that social time, uh, like they believe themselves like, oh yeah, I'll do it later. I can put off this non-important, non-important thing of social or food or whatever thing doesn't have a deadline for the thing that it does right noah's been patiently oh sorry, sorry. Uh, raising sorry. His hand. no it's fascinating i and i mean i guess i guess the main thing i wanted to just touch on or ask is probably something it's not surprised something i've said before and i'm wondering about maybe it's in the right space but i think we had this conversation last time too we had this data workshop but um you know, like the last, la um, the meeting last night, right? Like, uh, and all the things we're talking about now are all about like, we're not talking about your ability to read and write and do math, right? We're talking about the emotional landscape of students and their resilience and all that kind of stuff. And I guess my question is like, again, we we talked about a little bit of what are we making it any headway on like getting data on it, right? And like being able to track that and like actually being able to answer these questions in a quantitative way that you can look at are they these students more stressed out or less stressed out and like are the are we their stress levels are are, are positive emotional states or negative emotional states? Like, i mean this, i mean have, i guess that's you know, susan and brian and kevin yeah i mean the short answer is yes the dei uh, data committee mm -hmm. is putting together surveys it's 
for parents, staff, and students. And certainly some of it has a pretty specific DEI focus, but it's also getting into some of these, um, you know, non-academic aspects of, do you feel like you belong? Do you feel like you have community? Do you feel safe? I don't know I if we specific. For my 10th grade year. Oh, yeah. so I did a school-wide poll. I had 300 answers and there was one person in all of that data that said school does not add to their anxiety. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, it'd be awesome to be able to take the kind of like approach we do with the NUIA data be like, the students like A, B, C, who's, what groups are like. Yeah. On your social study. emotional. Yeah, I know that's a long ways off in the first sort of climate assessment. But yeah, I just. I'm not yeah, no, I, I mean, I think I think you've been pushing that point. I, I yeah. think it's a good point. And uh, short answer is it, it didn't show up here. And it's yeah. partly because there was so much complexity just to the NOIA data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, and partly because just timing wise, right, yeah, yeah. the, the no, survey is coming right out this one. fall. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's a very valid point. I, I, I think we're pushing in that direction. Yeah. I also think going back to something Meredith said is um, we need to think about advising students about APs, right? Because I also think we might want to think about advising about college. I think we had, we, I don't know, and, and this is not specific to OHS, but this is partly driven by my wife's experience as a school counselor to another um, school in the area. The, the school, and this goes back to the data you were showing about cost, right? The school landscape has changed to an incredibly complicated landscape that very few people understand. And at the one end, you have these 100, you know, very high-end schools that are full-need schools, right, which are actually as cheap or cheaper than the University of Maine, if you get into them, right? And then we have the University of Maine, and then we have this big pile in the middle that unless your parents have a certain level of income are actually not even an option, right? And I, I feel like, you know, we still have this 1970s kind of attitude about go pick any school, find the right schools to fit. And the financial landscape is really very different that there are these two buckets that um, make sense. And there's this bucket in the middle that only makes sense for five, 10% of our kids on the socioeconomic bracket. And then you start walking back, what does an AP score mean in each of those places? And as you guys rightly said, an AP score of even a five, if you go to Bowdoin, may not mean much. It might mean you get to skip calculus and go straight to Calc 2, but it doesn't mean much. But if you go to the University of Maine, those AP scores mean you could finish in three years instead of four years, which is a very substantial financial advantage, right? But it depends. <laughs> I, I just feel like the whole picture of what happens after high school the landscape has complexified a lot, and we probably haven't caught up with communicating that fully to the students. I think that was a big tone of a, a chunk of question from the OHS staff was how do we educate ourselves so we can better ab about the options and what an AP score means at different type of colleges or what 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 are the pathways out there that, that kids um, might be um, interested in, it, and then how do we help educate students to set them up for success or whatever that that pathway is that they. Your kids are there. And it does, I think, right now, feel um, we're sort of at the self education stage yeah. of things because that world has broadened and for lots of different reasons, there are two different pathways. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad that the staff are thinking that. You know? Yeah, that's great that they're asking. I, I feel like it's shifted a lot in the last 10, 15 years. Well, the compass that the, um, that the article lands on for. Um, I, navigating that shift is it juxtaposes what had been the college wage premium. So the difference that you can expect to make if you earn a college degree versus if you don't, um, which has been consistently um, motivational, right? I mean, I think that one of the numbers was, you know, so you can anticipate 65% higher income over the course of a career um, with a college degree than without. But the new metric that the article brings to light is the college wealth premium which includes in the calculation, the debt burden of attending college. And that makes it very nuanced, depending on um, what sort of major you go into and the duration of years you need in schooling in order to pursue whatever profession that you know major is, is um, leading you to. And it breaks down um, you know, a host of, of um, specific combinations of variables 
And then for each of those says whether, you know, what your likelihood is, is of seeing the return on your investment for college based on those variables. And, you know, one of the, the final assertions of the article is that um, we can no longer responsibly call college an investment because in the United States, college is now a gamble. And for some people, it will never pay back what it is taken in order to access it. And in particular, the key stat on that is whether you actually finish college or not. And yeah, so yeah, but the landscape's just, it's, you know, long societal discussion. I, I could do another version of Marx ran about how states have stopped treating education as a public good, right? We're unique, us in the UK have gone this route about uh, college benefits, you and you alone, it doesn't benefit society, so we're not going to pay for it. And so, you know, even UMaine, which is a good school, obviously I work there, but it's $10,000, $12,000 a year just for tuition, right? And if for whatever reason you want to get away from your parents and go to UVM and UMass, it's thirty dollars or $40,000 a year. That's just a different, line. you know, I have colleagues five, 10 years older than me that talk about paying $2,000 to go to school. <laughs> it's, yeah, the landscape has changed. And um, yeah, so there, there's probably a whole getting away from test scores but and from student stress but oh that's part of student stress yeah it's intimidating what it feels like we need to know now in yep. order to help kids navigate this uh which is was sort of the moment or the that the note that we struck at the end of that faculty meeting last week was like, holy cow like, we really need to we need to get our heads around this i feel like we've been talking a lot about you know what we're seeing at high school but one of the things that really stands out to me is that graph about, you know, what's happened during COVID to yeah. students and, and the, the losses that are just compounding now. And, you know, maybe it's, I mean, I, I just, there's so much to, you know, um, consider about that. And, you know, Meredith used the analogy that they talked about with the high school staff about, you, know, you just can't go back now to pre-COVID and make comparisons. So do do we just you know reset our norms? <laughs> I mean, so or do we pour a lot of resources, new resources into interventions? So I think that's a really big question. I think that we all need to grapple with as a nation, as a state, as you know, districts. Yeah, I and. Mean and just to channel one of our stakeholders who's on the um, strategic planning, uh, who is an employer and a hire, you know, his attitude was we expect the people we hire to have certain levels of math and reading skills. And I sure hope you guys aren't resetting your norms. Right. But the teachers in the room were like, oh, my gosh, you know, we just have so many more kids coming from homes with substance abuse or substance abuse issues of them, right? The whole landscape has changed such that we have to reset our norms. You can't have the same academic expectation. Um, so yeah, you're right. I, I think it's a big conversation about, uh, and you you said it, but I, the impression I got, it's only a one year trend, so you can't go too far with it, but compounding, we could, even though COVID's over, we could be spiraling, you know, Next year's score, looking at this year's scores is realistic. Next year it could be worse than this year, right? It's not okay to just say we're out of COVID. It's all going to get better and fix itself. That doesn't really seem like a safe assumption anymore. So, yeah, there's the discussion about what are our goals as a school. And there's also, I don't know, what what could we, what can't, well, what could we do about it? And then that quickly becomes what should we do about it? But I don't think anybody has super big. The only thing I've seen is kind of flooding the schools with volunteers, and that has that has its problems too. But you know, intervention is um, intervention seems to be the strategy that works, and we don't have the staff for intervention. So, creative solutions to the intervention is the only thing I've seen that's data supported. You know, like post COVID interventions is specifically an intervention model which requires lots of people, um, yeah. but yeah, there's a conversation about what what's our goal, and then there's a conversation if our goal is not to deviate too much from academic norms from before, what's that look like? 
because it's not just fixing itself at a minimum. That seems really clear. And super depressing. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Sorry. There's a nice silence afterwards, <laughs> punctuated. I heard the last time. <laughs> but, I mean, it's the people in this room's job to be looking the data in the face and asking those questions. I know I'm specifically in tune to senior stress, um, and especially in reference to how many of us have for lack of a better term, no idea what we're doing. Uh, and I love our guidance teams. One by one college breakdowns are not helpful. Because <laughs> if all of us, and what, it's 105 of us? 109. 109 of us go one by one to guidance. Guidance is not able to do their job for the rest of the school. Um, I would love in the future for future classes, I don't know, like a PowerPoint presentation on how to apply to college would be great uh, because stumbling your way through and asking, you know, your senior friends who graduated isn't actually all that helpful unless you're planning to go to their college. Because um, I could send a message to Tommy and be like, Tommy, how did you get into college? And then he would go, uh, uh <laughs> which, you know, <laughs> not super helpful or I can say like any of my friends who graduated or any of my teachers if I'm like hey how did you get in college how do you apply to college uh their answer is going to be well back in my day uh if you took one AP class the president of Harvard would show up on your doorstep uh, uh that is similar to an actual real life conversation I've had with a teacher about how to apply to college um it's I think I would love some today. It's been a long time since that was true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this no, no, particular no. teacher was like, if yeah, if you were a valedictorian, you got a letter from everybody with a full ride scholarship. And I was like, imagine, imagine. Uh, and then on top of that, supporting the students who like either have parents at home who um either did not go to college or went to college in a different country. Like for instance, my parents are very highly educated, but they did not go through the American education system. <laughs> Like, this is all very, like, it's very confusing. I'm their only child. In particular. We're all very confused, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, like, it's just, it's just, it's just a very confusing situation to be in. And also, they, if, a, if a student doesn't want to go to college, how to write a cover letter would be a super, like, just like a, a printout one page would be awesome. And I think that's what the high school's talking about. Like, looking yeah. at this data, how do we retool? re or make shifts to respond to this i think so i think from I think my that's perspective the... what's really hard i've been told for four years we're implementing it like it's going to be in next year this is like not specifically this thing but i know like my freshman and sophomore years it was uh mental health self stuff specifically like we're implementing it it's going to go in next year's curriculum it's going to go in um, and I definitely haven't seen a lot of effects from that. I think the the biggest targets are for people who are most vulnerable, which is super, super important. And I'm so grateful for all the work that everyone in this room has done. But anybody who's just sort of floating through gets lost in the fold. And they're becoming more and more vulnerable. Yeah. I, Preemptive methods, I think, could be super helpful to keep us from circling the drain. And I'm going to say something else so the silence isn't so awkward and looming. Uh, <laughs> I I do want to like absolutely drive home how grateful I am for the things that have happened, like the thing, the changes that I have seen um, while I've been here um, for those more vulnerable have been great. There's not really for middle of the pack swimmers. Okay, the cause silence, by the way, right? Yeah, this is a room we're supposed to be able to deal with discomfort. Room of adult silence is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> we should do a class on that. Yeah. <laughs> in the classroom with Carol just staring at that. I mean, it seems like as you pointed out, Meredith, we keep circling around two themes, right? High school, stress, more advising, more pathway adaption, more advising around pathways. 
is one theme we keep circling around. The other one is just this kind of, it's more of a K-8, I think, issue of, yeah, the trend in the test scores, it's not just all fixing itself. Even in this district with the low class sizes and the fantastic teachers, right? I mean, I think for a while we were like, well, our scores aren't as bad as the other schools. Um, we're not as bad as the national average. Thank goodness we're Orono with small class sizes and great teachers, but it also doesn't feel like it's just going away. Um, so, yeah. So if student responses are not business as usual, what does that mean about us not being business as usual? One insight shared in our um, our table last night was the idea that um, with our veteran faculty, that our teachers are folks who are um, perhaps we could argue most ingrained in the status quo, right? Whose careers have been dominated by like a particular way of doing things. And a teacher who was at our table talked about how you know, maybe one of the one of the biggest pivots that is going to be required in meeting this need is for teachers to just begin by rethinking the way that things have been done, right? And and recalibrating their own experience almost out of the frame in order to say, well, now now what do we do? And it was um that was something that I hadn't heard said before within the context of any of these conversations, that idea that our, our teachers really need to be able to think in new ways if we're going to make this happen, given how um, how steep they are in their careers and many of them, how long they have been in this specific district. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, that's true for all of us. Uh, you know, it's one thing to say, I need, I need to rethink how I, how I imagine these things, and then it's another thing to actually, actually do it. Yeah, disruptions have this funny thing that they present an opportunity, but they also demand a rethink from scratch and a total revamp. And, you know, the opportunity is exciting, but the demand is really, especially when we're all struggling, you know, to catch up in our own lives, um, it's challenging too. Any other board members? Anybody yeah, else? Great. I know it seems terrifying. <laughs> Uh, Grace, Grace went through this where it was, there was like a real sense of, you know, she applied to UMaine amongst other schools. She's in Hawaii now, um, terribly homesick. And uh, there was a, definitely a vibe that like UMaine would be a concession prize for certain students. Maybe you feel that too. Like, oh, I only went to UMaine. And I would tell her, you know, like if failure is UMaine, what a fantastic life. Yeah. Right, and it's, it's, I'm sure it's hard yeah, to see that. You know, you know? <laughs> but you know, it's there's it's so unfortunate that these sort of amazing, hardworking students feel this pressure because there are so many opportunities that are so close to, to being in reach, and then so many that are so far. And I don't know, I, I can't fully articulate it, but oh, I wish I had more succinct advice. But you're doing remarkable already. <laughs> you're Thank you're you. going to do great. There are lots of opportunities, and you're alluding to these things too. The the other aspects of your life and how you relate to people, and those are absolutely crucial. Because even if you end up with that high paying X Y Z job or whatever, I'm going to uh, be teaching. That's not me. <laughs> yeah. All right. That that's great. But it, it's, I think it's challenging for educators too. I think it happens in the university. I've met so many students that reach their senior year and um, that. They weren't really advised, right? Because you know you have this captive audience. You have faculty; they're very good at getting PhD jobs, and then you have educators here who are very good at getting educator jobs. And then our jobs are to, are to advise people to get that job or one of several others. I don't know. It's keep your friends. <laughs> it's almost like the amount of energy that's put into it. Uh, I know in our AP, I'm in uh, AP um, AP Lit. And that's our first assignment, is write the worst first draft of a college essay you possibly can. Great. And it's supposed to like get us over that fear of like putting ourselves down on paper. But then the first lesson he taught us was how to kill our darlings, uh, how to make the um, how to make the um, essay match the length requirement instead of the 600 pages of who we are as people. 
Um, I would love to hear some of my classmates, 600 pages, who we are as people. Uh, but it's just, there's a lot, there's a lot of pressure. And this school is like one of those that people shout out is like, oh, Orno, you go to Orno, they've got like the best test schools in the county. And it's test scores in the county. I'm like, <laughs> um, and it's, it's very interesting energy. Especially being from Corinth, where people will be like, oh, you live in Corinth? A great sports team. <laughs> so I'm sure there's a theater kid over there who feels the same. <laughs> I do know we have several other things that yeah, take some time. Good. So, anything else? I mean, you know, the the thing about the high school, I kind of feel like the high school's on top of it. But I don't know if we need to come back to the other topic. I don't know when the right time for that is, but um, I guess we can we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, any last minute? This is informal, so this includes everybody. It's not just board. Any any other comments people wanted to share about the tests and the reflections? Okay. Uh, so next up, we have <laughs> you guys are back on. So as you, as you all know, uh, I found out from Doris and Marissa that it is just the second year it's existed, which is why we hadn't known about it before. But there is now a national training for uh, student board reps. And there's a National Society for Student uh, Board Reps, and they went to it, and they're going to tell you about it. And they're probably a slideshow. Probably going to raise some questions for us. Do you want? To, are you on the Zoom? Do you want to share? Are you sharing your screen or just talking? Um, we need to be on the Zoom. Can you share your screen? I need you to. The presentation is on. Um, um, oh, I can share it if you want to share. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Google slide. I'll send it to the, 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 the folder. So if you want, do you want me to share it? Is I would love that. that. See them. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's my exact. <laughs> We went to the NS and um, the NS. Yeah, I've never allowed a board member association conference. Yes. Um, no, we can go to the next slide. <laughs> hey, what is this? Oh, about? Sorry. <laughs> uh, the conference was a collaborative gathering of current or past student board members from every level, uh, from local to state. Uh, we had conversations on the three Ds of student suppression, the importance of student votes, mental health, the importance of SATs, which are uh, student advisory guidance, uh, and the value of the student voice. Uh, so a major theme throughout the entire conference that was really like, drilled into us from like, like the opening presentation was the three Ds of student suppression, which are devaluation, dismissal, and double standard. Devaluation, which is the first one, is invalidating, demeaning, or lessening the contributions of a student board member due to age or student status. And this isn't just the board members, it's uh, students in any context with adults. Uh, an example of the board is if a board member says that a student's insight is useful for a student, they're devaluing their contribution uh, as less than an adult board member. And there's dismissal. A uh, dismissal is intentionally ignoring or dismissing the student's input on the basis of perceived inability or lack of understanding. So, for instance, a board member saying that a student board member, what, what a student board, student board member says is useful but not really relevant as you are not a taxpayer or a real stakeholder in the school, um, this is dismissal by writing off the SBMs or their age and letting valuable insights go to waste. Uh, the last one is double standard creating different expectations and incoherent regulations between student and adult board members. If an adult board member is allowed to have access to materials for a meeting a week ahead of time and the SBMs only get them the day of, this makes the SBM less prepared and is not being treated like they're part of a team. Sure. Uh, <laughs> our conclusion from this, uh, now that these things have come to the attention of everyone in the room, Please keep an eye out for them in your conversation and discussion. It is not only on students to remind you that these things happen when you speak. Please be aware of how you're choosing to speak to any student, not just SBMs, 
age isn't something that makes people automatically more or less qualified. Uh, remember that sometimes this perspective that someone else has is just as valuable as your own. This is for any of our students on any of our student advisory boards. Mm -hmm. Next is mental health, which we've pretty much addressed here. So I feel like I should say that like we were all um like divided into individual cohorts. Yes. That like discussed different topics. So for instance, I were on the student voting rights, which we will discuss later on the presentation. Um, we'll do a quick one of this. The next slide has. More specifically, what we talked about, which was hyper competition, which we've addressed here today. Uh, so I won't read this to you, um, other than to highlight that sometimes adding more AP and honors classes only helps what the school looks like in the offering of AP and honors classes. Um, keep it in the back of your mind, maybe. Uh, student voting rights is next. Uh, yeah, so I was on the student voting, voting rights um, cohort, and what was really interesting about this was that. Out of all of them, I, well, I would say seven, eight of us, um, I was the only one who was not a voting member whatsoever. There were a majority were symbolic voting, which we'll dis um, discuss later on. And then there was one who was who had full voting rights, who was serving on the Massachusetts, Massachusetts like DOE to the to that. Okay, so the three forms of um, voting that I just discussed were um, non-voting, symbolic voting, and just a full vote. The first slide is non-voting. Yes. Um, for non-voting, a student member can't vote and can only express their opinions. Um, for example, we are a non-voting district, meaning that um, we are not allowed to vote on any issue, even if it affects students. The next one is symbolic voting. A student member may raise their hand or be called in a roll call vote, but their vote holds no value in the final say. Many schools in northeastern states choose symbolic holding, voting as a choice for SBMs, meaning the student vote does not affect the final choice as they are not and elected by district. That's required by Maryland State. The Maryland least, State gets at least symbolic least voting, but voting. encourages um, regular yeah. full voting. Next is voting. Yeah. So full voting, a student a member can vote on any issue except for executive sessions. Um, and that vote holds the same as a non-student board member. Yeah. Okay, so in conclusion, having an understanding of what voting means to the voice of an SPM is very important. Um, learning about different districts and their voting procedures have opened conversations and understanding of how better to use our voices as a non-voting district. You're very excited about this. So we had an idea. Well, okay. So um what we learned is actually that the state of California requires every student um every school board to actually have a student advisory council. Um is required by state law. And essentially, can you go on the next slide, please? Um essentially it's a council often run by the student board members whose job is to communicate student interests, concerns, and achievements accurately and thoroughly. And from like what we've been discussing, we would probably meet or like regularly or like once or twice a month. Why are SACs is important? No person can be everywhere at once. And the importance of SACs is to reach the most students possible. In practice, this would be a structured times for us to meet with leaders of clubs, sports, members of the student body who wish to speak to us directly. We learned that just reaching the people that feel comfortable with us is only people, but not everyone. To do our jobs most effectively, like any member of the board, we need access to a variety of folks and their perspectives in an organized manner. Giving more people access to the board can only help our district in terms of communication. Methods to promote student feedback. Yeah, so what we learned is that a lot of different districts um you like have many different ways of promoting student feedback, whether it's an Instagram account to actually like spread what's actually going on, like um in actual like this what 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 we're doing, what's actually being discussed, um um by administration and stuff, and then we might have like an email account where people just email us but they can't find us in person. Um, sometimes kids just don't want to face us in person, so like an anonymous tip box. Um, what actually was really interesting is that uh, one girl I was talking to, um, her and her fellow board member, they had 
basically established office hours that were basically run as a club after school that students would, could just like come in if they like needed to talk to them. So like they knew where to find them at that specific time. Um, and then just like we could say stuff in the um, morning announcements. The importance of student voice. The main takeaway from the seminar is that students are the reason that school boards exist. We are the main stakeholders. Our position as SBMs is an important one to get the perspective of the student to afford removed from their time in school. We were taught to speak up and be unafraid to share our perspectives as that is the very reason we were chosen for this position. Start and NSCMA have given us networking and to make positive changes in ourselves and to better communicate our needs to the board, our peers and the public. Another idea. Um, <laughs> another thing that we learned about was that a lot of districts have an established handbook that essentially, oh, yeah, we, to to we, we talked about it on the uh, um, That you. essentially um, outlines the role of a student board member and just basically establishes what they can and cannot do, what their actual position is. And this is not only helpful for the actual student board members to actually like, understand what they're doing and why they're there in the first place, but also for others, for um, board members or for just members of the public or other students who may be interested in that position or just like a lot of kids don't know who we are, what, what we're doing. They they don't know that there are like, kids don't know what the school board is. No, to be honest, they don't know what means. Like, they don't know. Um, and they don't know, obviously, that like where like their representatives were their voice on the school board. So essentially, it would just be a way to not only like outline and just like just re reduce the confusion about just like the um in the whole, but just to um make people aware that we are on this like we are representing everyone like all the students and, and it would we, help with turnover this is a very yes a uh, rapidly changing position based on who can sit in these seats um and it would it would help get the next sbms uh in the seats ready to go from day one i know we had a quiet phase uh <laughs> and trying to eliminate that to the most of our ability um and we would write it we wouldn't put that on any you don't know. Yeah, we wanna we wanna do this now because we don't wanna make anyone else have to do that. Like and also we're nerds, it's fine. Like we'll do it. We'll do it. I'm actually really looking forward to it, to be honest with you. Um it would also be a live project. So as the board changed, as we changed, as yeah. the position changed, like regularly updated. It would be regularly updated. And it would have uh, fun little con columns about all of you and uh, how to interact with you. Um <laughs> 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 This is our nice. ending slide. Uh, we absolutely recommend all future board members go to this conference. Uh, they can understand the importance of their role. They understand the importance of speaking up. And it's definitely more um, angled towards student board members who are fresh new kids off the block. So we were very prepared for this. We got to do a mock board meeting, which was so much fun. I got to give an impassioned speech about why mental health services are required in a middle school. And then essentially we were supposed to represent um, our own um, um, voting rights on the actual um, school board. But then since so many of us didn't have voting rights, all of the people who were elected as yeah. leaders, none of them had voting yeah, rights. Yeah, so I got full voting rights. So it was very difficult not to get power hungry very fast. <laughs> there was a very big chain and it felt very powerful in that moment. Um, but yeah, definitely. And also this is a, really more interactive conference than either of us like that we were just expecting to just have to sit there for three days it was a three-day college yes we yeah, had notes no. yeah we took notes i have like a like, bunch of notes on it um and then we like actually did this like discuss things all the time we had to i had to make a presentation in like 30 minutes like a full presentation this whole like board of like different um um, different teachers and people who have like been like who work on legislation stuff like that um because my other person was supposed to work on it had to leave early so it was like there was a lot of homework involved yeah a lot of preparation so and it was still summer yeah <laughs> i still got in contact with the people who were in my my little mental health co co cohort um uh, i mentioned lacy i check on her every now and again to make sure that she's not awake at three o'clock in the morning this is send her a little message at 6 a.m Please go to bed before you have to go to school. 
Um, she's from California and is in like the, I think she was right. Her district is the most competitive district in the entire United States of America. And I'm like, I re I just, it's, she's where we got a lot of uh, class ranking discussions about how in her school, people have tricked the guidance counselors into printing off a different person's transcript and giving it to them so that they can see where their ranking in class compares to like an enemy or a friend. Which is it's, it's the whole concept is crazy because the thought program that I went to, there were so many like, insanely like just well, like well rounded, like very, very like high achieving students. Like and like the point where you go the Senate page program, no. and we don't need to discuss that. <laughs> um, but uh, one of them goes to this like insane feeder school in Connecticut where essentially, like, like their support systems for kids are pretty good just because it's so crazy competitive. But then the competition is insane because all these kids are equally as um, prepared to, and like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? High achievers? Yeah, they're high achievers. And like, they all have like, they're all insanely good at, at different things. Like they're all good at the same things essentially because they're all so high achieving that like the competition between them to get into the same college is insane. So like, it's not only like affecting their own, like, no, 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 anyway. <laughs> but so essentially like, it also just affects their whole like relationships like among like, like, like friendships and stuff like that because they don't trust their friends. That's unhealthy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are. We learned a lot of things about the unhealthy relationships. There are districts that are much more competitive than our districts. Yes. 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 Uh, do you guys have questions, concerns, things you would like answers? Well, I mean, yeah, let's let's go ahead and do questions first. Let's begin the revolution. <laughs> Full endorsement of your of your plans. Well, I mean, just to follow that up, what would be your asks? I mean, what, what, what would you like us to work on as a board, right? So we have finite time, but this is an important topic. So yeah. what are the one or two or three things you would like us as a board to uh, work on? Um, I think starting with being very aware on how you address all students would be great. You guys are better than a lot of the uh, boards that we had discussions about but you're still adults with power over us, which like I mentioned before, adult silence, scariest thing in the world. <laughs> um, and just being aware of your power and of the fact that we don't know you guys very well. Yeah, um, one thing we were like talking about was like just establishing like the relationships from like us to you to the end of the day. Yeah. Like, Talking to someone that you barely know is very terrifying. Yeah. Especially when that person is a grown adult man. Uh, I know you know well, so that, like, um, you guys are the people yeah, that... They, Brian and I met with Dorset and Marissa, and one of the things that I said was, you know, we don't really know the board members, so it's really hard to feel comfortable interacting, so I think we can uh, brainstorm some ways to, like, a welcome reception yeah, where just casually... Yeah. I know one of the things that, like, we talk about, sometimes we'll see... Uh, Brian, we'll see you like in the wild, like out in town. <laughs> I saw you getting into your car for Nutting Hall a couple of days ago, and I was like, wow. <laughs> see, that's the difference is your parents would have come up to me and said, Brian, this is really bad at the schools, and you have to work on this right now. <laughs> like, pretty consistently, I will get like a random one bubble text from Dorsa that just goes, B McG sighting. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's something that regularly happens. And I'll send one back to her, like, if I'm at James's house and I see you through, and I'm like, B McG, how majestic. <laughs> uh, and we would, like, we would love to be able to make like actual connections on you. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes a lot of sense because we've talked about it even with the, in yeah. the board, like at this point, we've all been working together for over a year, I think, or close to a year at least, I think over a year at this point yeah. for everybody. And so we kind of gotten to know each other, but there was a time when it was important to us to like get to know each other yeah. and make connections. So there's no reason it should be any different for you. So like Meredith said, I, I think we can brainstorm, but I, I think that's that's a good point and we can work on something about that. Important meeting, but it's just 20 questions between you guys. <laughs> well, and your point that the positions turn over typically yeah. annually. Yeah. So hmm. when I observe new board members who are elected coming on, it takes that board member really some time to 
settle into the role. And I, I think, you know, someone said it felt like, you know, drinking from the fire hose for, and, and, <laughs> you know, the same is true of the student board rep, only really by the time you settle in, you're like halfway through your term. And so I I'm, I'm not sure. Right now we're split into like, like, Classics and newbies right now. <laughs> and I'm not totally room. sure how to solve yeah, the issue, but I think sleep. we can do better. Yeah. Right, also, because... that brings up the question of um, how does that term work for us? Because, like, I know that a lot of districts basically have like a junior and senior one. So, like, the senior is their second year. So, like, they don't start off with like, a blank slate every year. Like, they have like one more senior one who, like, actually like knows what's going on. So like you don't know, have like two very confused like me and Marissa at the beginning of our term where we're like what are we even doing here? Especially because we were like blank slate post COVID hadn't had a couple a couple of years. Uh, yeah. it was it was an interesting term. It was why we would like the hand the handbook. Um, push that idea again. <laughs> just to sneak yeah. that in there. Sorry, we I interrupted. But yeah, is that the second ask? Is that uh, I or? I think. Um, our second ask might be we ask you guys for like some one on one time to write that handbook to be like, what are your likes? What are your just like just humanize you a little bit. Um, <laughs> you guys very like, I don't know. I, I remember I was talking to you about like in our first couple of weeks is I compared you guys to the judges at Hades. Like, if you, if you know Greek mythology at all, they put a whole bunch of important people like up here and they're just like looking down and they make decisions. Um, but also like getting you guys out to the general population of students. Um, it's like students don't know who you are. They don't know who's on the board. I had a student come up to me and be like, ah, oh, I wish I could talk to the school board. And I was like, there's a meeting tonight. We have a public comment section. And they were like, there's a what? Uh, let's do this. I'm just in the office every day, just like, come to a school board meeting, please. I, and that's for me. I've been I think saying this since the beginning that I there has only been a year and a half to which is like I feel also completely removed from the student body. And like, yeah. And like I want and the teacher body too. And like as a board member, I wish I were more integrated. And I and I think there's certain policies and reasons we're not not supposed to mingle in certain ways. And but I I feel the same. I think it would be cool if we had like a mix, an annual mix. But there's like sunshine laws and all the good things. Yeah. Figure that out. Yeah, and that's what I was actually um, working on. Well, I'm running for VP, guys. If you want your kids to vote for me, um, <laughs> student council, student council, and essentially like one of the ideas where I had was like we need to actually use the student council as a way to like establish that connection better with admin, where there's just such a disconnect. But I feel like that's like definitely an important thing that we should definitely be working on. And there's definitely differences between individuals. Um, and I think the ask for you guys would to like, obviously you're adults, so it's not going to be like, you're not going to have a me endorse a relationship with us, but having, I don't know, some sort of mentorship thing or like you, you show your face every now and then we make a poster it's just you guys dressed up as superheroes something uh to just give you help yeah um i know things that could connect you in asa they do like read alouds uh closer to the summer they call folks in who are uh you know in position i know miss higgins has done it in the past i'm plugging my own mom's things right now um <laughs> so like you know Things like that, where I don't know, you come in, you play a game with us, because we have a lot of those days. Firefighter field day at ASA. ASA has a lot more opportunities than high school does. Uh, but, you know, things like that, where you guys, you know, might not be working, or maybe you are working, you show up for 10 minutes, and be like, hello, and then leave. Um, seeing, seeing, seeing you guys would be super useful to our student body, in my opinion. Um, and I think admin relationships are a big part of that too because I know a lot of student body knows you really well uh, and I know um, Miss Diamond has sort of unofficially been given the title of like data czar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like at any point if you, if you ask any of the student body being like okay so there's a there's like a data collection that we're trying to do. Any of them could be like, Miss Diamond's running a new club. Miss Diamond's doing a new thing. Um, it's, you know, it's important to have those categorizations in our head, but like getting to know us. Also, any amount of like non-classroom teacher collaboration with students would be great. 
most of our student body doesn't know our janitor's names. <laughs> like I, I, that I think would be a great way. Day janitors, we should know their names. Uh, yeah, what are, I'm now. So connections and relatability. Connections and relatability. So ooh, what about the voting? Oh, yeah. This one you're really passionate about. Oh, hey, hey, right. hey, don't go. <laughs> you want me to start? Yeah. Okay. You can read um, thoughts. After this uh, meeting, after this, uh, this conference, we are writing a proposal for some legislation, the two of us, to standardize uh, voting rights for uh, SBMs across Maine. And we would love in the near future if we could bump up to symbolic voting rights, maybe uh, just as a little treat for being so nice to you guys. <laughs> uh, that's like a big part of our, uh, the bit that we didn't put in there. Yeah, and we already have connections with people who have written um, Oh, uh, legislature. Um, for instance, Simon. Yeah. What's that? It's not, it's not Simon. It's not it's John. 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 Oh, his last name is Simon Ellie. So yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I was in the right like track. Yeah. There. So Sean was my uh, counselor for this group, and he actually uh, penned the uh, legislation that's happening in Massachusetts right now. Yeah, that's a, currently going. Yeah, there's it's, an active yeah. court battle to uh, universalize, like in um, like in Maryland. I don't actually think there's um, state legislation that requires student board representatives. No, I don't think there is like a Step one. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> that, I mean, that would place. seem like a logical progression. That might be a place to start. Yeah. Because right now it's just because this board values it and has said we want to have it. And I don't know how common it is across the state. So I don't think most of the neighboring towns that I know yeah. have it. Questions I guess related to the I mean I mean I'm also first in support of the concept and I, I also I mean I know that we should wait for the legislation to, to do what we want to do here as if they're having. Um but I guess one of my questions around that is you know as this relates back to the point you're making not only about your representation on the board but your representation back to the student body, right? And I forget and we I asked this question and maybe I just like one line you're out the ice space out half the time for more than I'm here. Oh, but the nature of how you're selected and how you represent it in, in theory, we represent a democratic process in the public. In practice, we don't because none of us are contested elections. <laughs> um, so, uh, but in theory, there's, the, 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 there's like an election process or through student governance. And it, it, that's not how this, no, is, right? No, so, I guess my question, lie. right? And so, like the process for selection. And it would seem to be a natural part of having a voting role yeah. because then, in some formal way, you are representing a populace, and yeah. then there's some feedback, whether through student council or, or whatever. But, like, does that sound yeah? Like what... And I feel like definitely that's something we have considered. Where, like, right. obviously, I think it's very undemocratic to have like an, an appointed voting, like, it's yeah, the, no, right. <laughs> but um, yeah, definitely, like, that would um require like a reconsideration of just like how this whole position works where it may be just like we do apply and then like well you don't want just like someone who's not going to take the position seriously to apply either because like I feel like with like what's difficult about a general election if it was no application no cover letter required just apply we'll put you in for the student body I know of three people right now who would apply as a joke and accidentally win well, that happens in real politics, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, honestly, off the top of my head, this moment, I can think of three people who would be like, yo, yo, vote for me. I'm going to get on the student board. I'm going to change all kinds of stuff. So if maybe it was an application to a vote, that would maybe be more democratic, where finalists get to be voted on. Um, honestly, I kind of really enjoy the application process. But they made me write a cover letter for the first time in my life, which... I had to reassess my resume. I had to reassess my resume in two years. Um, I mean, I, I will say through this election process, I mean, totally I can see the election, but on the other hand, there is student council, which is an elected body. Yeah. I can say that, you know, having done this with Meredith for several years, number one, you may remember last year we had no volunteers, right? So th this is not, you know, that's, that's a context to keep in mind. Often other years we've had 
you know, two or three people apply for those two seats. So that's a context. Also, Meredith and I are actively screening for people who are actually going to show up, right? We have a conversation about schedules and Tuesday nights and things like that. We're screening for people who have some understanding that they're representing ACE in the middle school as well and have some ability to express how they're going to do that. Uh, and, you know, and some commitment to do that. And those are things that I don't know. I mean, once you start an election, is it the high school that votes or are you going to yeah. let ASIC students yeah, vote? Yeah, for... students. I mean, that's my other question I was going to ask too, like in these other districts, it was like, how can anyone like, uh, what we how do you represent the district that maybe only has the voters? Like, if they're in a state that requires representation, like does that, do, um, are there age limits? Um, none of the ones I met were elected, um, and some of them did have voting rights. It was an appointed position by the superintendent and um, head of the board. Are you the head of the board? Okay. Yeah. I just I don't know what the terminology is. Chair. Sure. Okay, Jay. Okay. So they're all anointed by the... They're, uh, yeah, they're appointed, and then the voting rights had to go. <laughs> 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 The voting rights were more based on what they believed the student body would do than the their like qualifications of appointment was that they would represent the student body. Most of the ones I met were representing multiple high schools, not multiple, yeah. multiple schools, not a high school, a middle school, and elementary school. Uh, it would be like District 36 has 17 high schools, and probably not 17, but you know, a large number of high schools, and they've got a representative from each of them, which goes into their SAC, which we would love, which would help us with voting, is it wouldn't just be high school, it would be middle school and elementary school as well. Um, uh, that, you know, would be a part of that. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I think there's an interesting conversation to have about connecting the <laughs> student reps with the student body and whether an election facilitates that or doesn't facilitate that. I do want to, just because I'm somewhat sensitive to dime, especially I know we're past eight, we try and release the refs at eight um, to get a sense of the board about the symbolic voting. So, I mean, we've talked about the Dorsa and Marissa. I, I think we're all clear that the state of Maine does not support students voting, right? There's a legal process about uh, boards and elections and things. So the, the actual voting is not something that's on the table until you guys change the state legislature, which I I'm certainly willing to help. I'm certainly willing to help with that. But um, until that happens, right, the only thing that's a choice is we can continue the current practice or we can move to some sort of symbolic voting. And I think Meredith and I were talking about if we had symbolic voting, what would the lines be? And probably would be voting on everything that doesn't come out of an executive session, right? So personnel matters like hiring teachers or non-hiring teachers. Right. Um, or the other thing typically that would come out of an executive session would be union contracts. Right. I think there's some real putting students in an awkward place in a position about being involved with their potential teachers. Uh, and also, I think there's there's legal issues uh, in terms of confidentiality. Well, what about something like poker? That also raises an awkward issue. That doesn't come out. Of yeah. I, well, this is why I want to talk about it. So, yeah, co-curriculars is something to think about. Uh, that does have, doesn't have the confidentiality, but it well, it could. Sometimes we've been to executive session over co-curricular, uh, but it does have that voting on teacher. But I just wanted to get a read from the board. Uh, you know, so there's lots of ways we could scope it, right? It's not going to be literally every single vote, but, um, but I, I just want to get a read from the board about the thought. So, you know, a symbolic vote it just means we count those votes and record the votes in the minutes. Uh, legally, it would be still three votes out of five on the board that um, would mean letting them raise their hands and vote at the Senate and have that vote recorded as part of the minutes. So I'm just curious what other board members think about that. Are we taking turns or? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm, I'm in favor of um, the symbolic means symbolic voting. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it allows them the agency to vote on things uh, publicly to express their opinions. And if they take on some controversial positions, then that's part of democracy and trying those things out. 
Um, as noted, they can't actually change the outcome of the vote. So there's no no danger of a student takeover yet. Um, <laughs> don't worry, we'll get so <laughs> I, I don't I don't see any problems. I agree with you know obviously hiring issues and stuff. You know that's confidential, but um, I don't see any issue with allowing it. And we personally wouldn't want to vote on that stuff anyway. So no, and uh, voting like full voting positions also exclude the executive um, positions anyway. And your point on co-curriculars. Thus far, we haven't seen a co-curricular vote that you guys hadn't uh, all agreed on, and we over here privately on our own little notepads have all agreed on. Um, that it would be if we wouldn't affect that, obviously. Uh, and, yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think I'm generally supportive. The only downside I can see is like the extra time in counting the votes. <laughs> but that's not a big downside to me. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be very efficient about that. Um, but, uh, but like, I, I mean, I guess the only thing though, yeah, I mean, I would like to see make, moving towards representation in some sense. Yeah. And making sure that we're feeling like we're, this isn't just like it's somehow selected yeah. and out of, but there actually is this, this feedback and whether it's election or whether it's, a nomination process through and maybe through the student council or some nexus of something that's sort of in between a full vote and like a something. But yeah, I I think I think it makes total sense. One of the things that occurs to me is, you know, in previous years we've had such a range of student representatives from people who never said anything to people who you know, were actively involved in discussions and didn't have to be prompted to, to do that. And um, and so I think symbolic voting could help give all of those kind of individuals a way to engage and, and be a part of, um, you know, the decision-making and making their opinion known. Um, but I also, something you just said, we often, dismiss and students really do often leave at eight because they have lots going on and lots of times the action items happen after eight so that's just a little bit of a I wonder how that's is going that, to that's work. what I always had that same question. yeah so is just that, something to consider yeah of how often when we get to meaty topics those things happen after eight because right. things have taken so long with discussion so just that's just a Observation. The more yeah, to think about. It drags on to like eleven. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, a budget vote or some of the yeah. most yeah. important votes. And I like when we like first talk, well, we were like, "We're probably not going to leave the Like, yeah. honestly, like, we'll we enjoy a little bit too much. <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying that to say, well, if we do this, you really should stay after eight because it could also be we were just talking about earlier about. about all the things, right? So I, I also don't want to set up this like pressure to. Yeah. So I just think it's something to think through. Um, it could be a restructuring of priorities as well. Of uh, if there's something that the board feels that we should that they want our input on, having that place before eight o'clock, hypothetically. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Easier yeah. said than you know. Looking at the yeah. looking at the agenda tonight, we probably weren't thinking like, ah, oh, yeah, eight thirty will be when we start this discussion. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's a difficult tightrope to walk, I guess. Yeah. Um, especially because you know people who the brain says audition. What is it actually? A black <laughs> people that apply for this position. Uh, have like those those life stressors going on as well. Um, it's a very interesting thing that we would have to address. Like, will we burn that bridge when we get to it? Nope. What's that for? We cross that bridge. We cross that bridge. We cross that bridge. I think maybe we. Yeah, we should. Yeah, think about it. Yeah, I, I don't think we should take a decision tonight. I think we, you know, lots of issues have been raised. We should let let this sit and come back for conversation and maybe potentially a vote uh, if next time. But yes, Noah. The process thought we could nominate them and then they could be confirmed by the student body. So that would be like a that's similar to kind of how teachers write 
the superintendent like nominates and we vote. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I, I'm not as worried about that part. I know, sorry. I, I mean, I do seem like you, you are. I'm not because I, I really. Well, I know you guys do a great job. In yeah. It's about the connection. And it's probably time. because I'm the one that gets to choose. Yeah. I have fear. There's complications in the back of my head with what you're advocating based on what I've seen. Uh -huh. Yeah. Even on my side of the but, but in some ways, oh no, raises a good point because yeah. anytime that you're, and again, this could possibly be because I study government, but anytime anybody gets to vote on things, right, when you're conferring that, even if it's symbolic, when you're conferring that kind of authority on someone, generally there needs to be something that makes that authority legitimate, right? Mm -hmm. And so somewhere along the line, there's some connection between someone. The body that is uh, the, the group of people who you're looking to represent, even if it's an indirect connection, there has to be a connection between that group and the people who are making the vote. And right now, that's not there, right? And so, I think in many ways, I think Noah is asking a super important question. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that would be that would be something for me that before I kind of weighed in on this, I'd want to know more about. I'd also want to know more about what exactly we're going to be allowing the student reps to symbolic vote on and what we're not going to be allowing them to symbolically vote on. But I think Noah's question, um, maybe for practical purposes, it's not important. For theoretical practical purposes, it's super important. I mean, one option, I mean, there's a lot of options, right? You, you could have a nomination and then vote process, which, you know, is used for many, many committees and things. A lot of businesses and church committees and nonprofits. That's right. There's a nominating committee that then presents things. There's a, also the student government could be the one that takes the vote. Well, it, that's what I mean. The confirmation by the student government. Right. So we nominate, they confirm. They're like the Senate, and we're like the president. And they're right. Green <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would want uh, student body confirmation, but also I would, I would love the student, the SBM connection to be bigger. Um, we are right now using social connection. Uh, people we know in real life, people that we see most every day, people that we go out of our way to talk to. Uh, and, hey, you got problems? Kind of like, yeah, genuine question I've asked some freshmen. Um, but it's also, most teachers don't actually know who's on the student board. Zoe keeps getting congratulated about being on the student board. Zoe is not a student board member, um, and I think if if there was a vote, if there was confirmation, there might be a little bit more information about us. Yeah, because we try. I know uh, when I'm doing announcements in the office, you know, quite a few kids come through to get lace passes, come in, all of that, and I'm like, you should listen to the you should listen to the school board meeting, or I say, hey, do you have anything that you want me to address with the school board? And, you know, those kids know that I'm on the school board for about 20 minutes and then I'm out of their sight one and then they don't know anymore. I, I, we can work with you at the building level to yeah. feel Thank you for that, you know, yeah. because I know that we have, you know, like I'm immediately thinking about like doing an advisory tour where you go about your yeah. advisory like periodically throughout the year and I'm sure that Richard and Carrie could come up with their own yeah. versions of ways to get and then because that's something that we can do, um, you know, for sure, just because, you know, you're right, like, in order to really represent student interest, that that would be necessary. Yeah, yeah and that's what we're doing. Like through, I guess through ASA and through yeah. the middle school, especially during the times when like we're not directly connected with them through like our like directorship of like the English and stuff like that. That like we go and sit in like their student council meetings, especially because like um like I I've gone and sat in like middle school student council mm -hmm. um meetings and just been like, hey, like. What things have been happening, and also like, do you have any input and insight, um, or just like anything? They meet at eight thirty in the morning. Confirmed by all three. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. 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 We wanted to sit in on an eight meeting, but both of us have uh, had block one classes consistently, yeah. um, and. I know I occasionally will send a message to Miss Neville, hey, where did you have last week after this? Um, to like try to get that connection. Um, but it's so hard when I'm in the middle of a writing center class or I'm in the middle of you know a different class to be like, I need to go at 8 30 to go uh, listen to uh, ASA talk because they have such important things and they do such cool things that it's it's hard to 
like be missing that connection when it's not December, January, when we're down there consistently. And I think, you know, the reality is student councils are also not necessarily built to fully represent the full scope of oh, yeah, interest. Yeah, and so building that's, it. that's I think what I'm trying to work on this year is to actually expand the role of our student council past just like a fundraising mm -hmm. um, like committee. Holding. Yeah, we're like actually using it to like amplify that student voice and also like establish those connections, just not only like between like student and admin. Um, so, and I know our ambassadorial roles have been helpful in doing advisory runs. Uh, I check in, I've checked in on my advisory once so far, and they were not too pleased that I was there. Actually, I was a little offended. I went into my freshman advisory and I was like, Hey, how are you guys doing? Are you settling in okay? And what I got back was a whole bunch of like tween boys looking me dead in my eyes and going, We're fine. Why are you here? You know, as you do. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right so lots of good conversation tonight i think it's good to just let it sit and lots of lots of issues raised lots of things thought about you guys it's way past eight so you're obviously welcome to go you're always also obviously welcome to stay that's entirely your call so the next topic is a uh, town discussion on election date this is um so you may or may not know the town council's having a discussion, the election date for both the, for all municipal offices, school board and town council is second Tuesday, I think. Yeah, second Tuesday in March, right? And there's a long history of that it was probably scheduled so that it was during spring break uh, at the university. And uh, anyway, there's a conversation, but it doesn't necessarily line up with that anymore because you mean spring breaks have changed. And that should all, you know, that's probably be irrelevant, but that's some of the history. The town council is discussing moving the municipal elections. So that would be school board and town council to the November election when turnouts would be much higher. Turnouts in March vary from 200 to four or 500, except for the one year when marijuana uh, was on the, uh, on the ballot. And there were 800 that turned out in March and they were mostly college students based on the enrollments. Um, but anyway, so the idea would be move it to November, it would have broader participation, probably broader college participation, but probably broader, uh, you know, non-college living off campus, uh, uh, older people representation as well in the voting in November. So that's, that's the discussion. The process is the council would vote to put it to a general election, and then the town of Orono would have to vote and it actually would have to be at a March election because that's currently our municipal election okay. to move it. So, you know, we're like two steps removed from the decision. The most we can do is give our voice to the town council and the town council, the most they can do is refer it to the citizens to vote on. That said, I know the town council, when they were discussing this, said, what well, we'd like to know what the school board think about because the school board's affected. Um, they... they seem to have dropped the ball on officially asking us to talk about it, but I happen to know that they asked us, to, <laughs> they wanted our opinion, at least the counselors wanted our opinion. So this is a chance to discuss it, right? There's all kinds of issues about representation and who's voting and how knowledgeable those voters are and uh, how much they know about the town and a whole bunch of other things, which may or may not be part of the discussion here, but there also is just the practical logistics of, you think about somebody showing up uh, on the town council in March, sorry, on the school board in March, or somebody showing up on the school board in, in November, right? This, when's the start? When do you start drinking from the fire hose, right? And I think it's been pretty noticeable that um, coming on in March in the middle of budget season is a very intense time to come on a board. It used to be way back 10 years ago when we were still part of a larger RSU, the school board election was in June. Which makes more sense. Or actually, the election was in March and people came on in June. You said it makes more sense? Having it in the June election would make the most yeah. sense for terms of timing. That, right. would, that would make it, that would be the best. That would be the best start time. The best chance to get the ground running. But once the RSU dissolved, I mean, the, again, the election was in March, but the start of the term was in June. Which had its own awkwardness because you had a lame duck sitting there for two months yeah. voting on the budget. 
I guess that's my question. Is there, can we not have a land dock in this? Well, there is a June election cycle, too. And that's, I mean, that's not something the town council is considering, but that would be an option. I mean, we could go back to them and there say There are plenty of municipalities around here that elect their municipal officers. Yeah. Including I mean, Glen Burn, I think, and Veezy. Or even if we had any, I mean, yeah, I guess that. We have we have no delay between the election and the like as we sit. Right. Is that, is that, a week after you sit. Is that a choice or is that a mandate? Must be in the town charter. Like they have, you have to be sworn in so many yeah. days yes. to take yeah. office. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I tend to like I tend to like municipal elections on their own. And, but especially if you're in a presidential cycle. Yes. You're now dealing with so far down the ballot that a yeah. lot of those are going to not be, not be filled out. And they're going to get zero attention, right? Yep. Um, municipal elections on their own cycle, I think, is a, is generally a good practice. That being said, my preference would be for June, not March. But I guess if I had to rank order them, I would go June, March, November in that order. I would add that um, I have the same concern that Mark does. I think when the municipal elections stand by themselves, the people that show up are much more in tune with what's going on versus the, versus the people who vote in November, especially in a presidential year, they just feel obligated to fill out the ballot. So they just, whatever, you know, yeah. so, you, yeah. or they don't fill it out at all, which is almost better than whatever. I mean, if you want voters to make informed decisions, right, which I assume they do, the more that they might come across information relevant to the decisions we're asking them to make um, makes it more likely they're going to be informed. In a November cycle, they're not going to come across any information on municipal uh, candidates. They're just not. Um, the way that you could get around that, and the way you get around it with with federal and state um, elections, too, are party leaders, but we don't have party leaders. Yeah. yeah. Right. So you, so you don't have that information heuristic okay. to fall back on. And to me, it, it, and this is, you know, this has nothing to do with whether students are here or not here. This is just in terms of how, what gives us our best chance to give voters a chance to have the information they need to make a choice that matches up with their preferences. Having a municipal election stand on their own gives them the best chance to do that. Yeah. I'm kind of torn. Uh, I completely agree about the, you know, the, the voters in March, I would say either watch candidates night or like one conversation removed from somebody who's watched candidates night, right? Whereas if we have whatever it is, three, four thousand voters in November, the fraction they're going to have that degree of connection to the actual candidates is quite small. And you're right, the best choice, the best hope is that they just leave it blank, but a, a fair number of them are going to whatever you know i vote for a man i vote for a woman i vote for somebody whose name starts with s right um starting to become pretty arbitrary uh in the voting that's the downside on the other hand i have a really hard time you know not voting for expanding participation i don't know it's a really tough choice i i really vacillate on that one i do think a november start makes a much more sense than a march start so from that point of view um, I also agree that June would be the perfect start time. So for us, but I wonder about the town council. They're they're in the thick of budget thick season of budget. in June. Yeah. When you say expanding participation, are you talking about the student population, or are you just talking about in general? Just in general, yeah. right? But my thought to that is. Anyone who wants to participate in March can. They can. And generally, the people who partic participate in March do so intentionally, right? Versus November, probably not as intentionally that far down the ballot. Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's a trade off between quantity. On the other hand, is it great that the taxes are set in this town by 300 voters? I mean, the people who are elected by 300 voters, which is a typical March turnout. <clears throat> Yes, you're right, but anyone can turn out. You're right. Their Nobody's keeping them away. It's not a high barrier election. It's pretty darn easy to yes. vote in March if you choose to. What 
makes us start our terms in March? Like, where does that rule sit in terms of the town charter? It's in the town charter and the ordinances, but I, we have to go back and confirm that. But that's my guess is that they probably give us so many number of days that after the election, within X number of days, the newly elected officials have to be sworn in and seated. And the election is in the town charter to occur in March, I believe. Yes. Not yes. Being considered to change. <clears throat> I know the town council had a whole conversation about if this is a minor change to the charter, they can do it just for the popular vote. If it's considered a major change to the charter, they have to start a charter convention and do a very involved process, which they were trying to avoid doing. I would assume this has got to be a major change for the one change in the election date. But if it's a one word change, um, it may count as a minor change. But anyway, they're consulting the lawyers. I don't think they've gotten the answer on that that I've heard. Any. I mean, I, I guess if we were talking about June from an election perspective, I think I I prefer March over June just from the populace of who's represent. I mean, like, and from a school perspective, like the people that are around in the school year, and the people that are around in the school year in June is, well, I guess it's summer. When in June is the election? Be it's the second, second Tuesday. So school is still in session. University's out of session, but our yeah. K-12 schools are in session, so hopefully nobody's off on vacation yet. I am. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have, we do have, um, you know, kind of no need absentee, right? Like, no. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. We, at least we, two weeks, if not a month beforehand. Well, it's just one more barrier, but it, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Would you change SBM to Power Point Station? Uh, you y'all told me when uh, the two of us were elected that you generally change over SBMs with the changing over of the, of the board. Yeah. Would you change that quotations for SBMs too? I think we'd have to think about that. I mean, yeah, November doesn't make as much sense for a student rep. What but it could. It could. I was going to say, I mean, if there was any chance that town council could, yeah, move when board members start, that'd be nice. Because uh, both because when I started, I, I did definitely felt I felt like two things. One, I didn't understand what's going on, and two, I felt reticent to throw wrenches in the works. If I didn't agree with something that you all had spent six months working on, it feels a little late in the party to to barge in. I didn't feel like I had a you know a community mandate to do that. Um, so the, 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 the fall, I mean, the summer has some light stuff. There's hiring committees, right? And then the fall is fairly gentle. And for somebody to start a little later, I don't know if the town council is interested in taking that on, but, but the March start was just brutal. Yep. And I would think it's brutal in the town council because they're starting, they're starting budget at least. I guess someone starts at the beginning of budget season for that. They, I mean, they really don't start budget till May. Um, or much later. They don't finish their budget till the end of July. They basically wait till we're done before they start their budget. Makes sense. I, in terms of just the two choices in the March versus November, I guess originally I was thinking November I would like, but thinking more, I, I see the argument for keeping the town election for the townies like that are gonna show up and be engaged and um be focused on that choice instead of the bigger choices and the down ballot things are just potential for random random noise. So yes, I would between those two I'd probably lean the March together. Okay. So I mean I'm not hearing a super strong uh opinion but it sounds like to the extent there's a lean it's leaning towards keeping things in march um once they're touching the charter they're going to be very hesitant to do enough touching to push it from a minor to a major change but is an election in march but seating in june is that something we would want to moot i mean mark and i were both in this situation we were elected and actually you were already appointed by the town council but i was elected in march and not supposed to be seated until June. Why was that? 
because we were back part of the RSU. Oh, it was RSU. Uh, and in my case, the person who uh, got elected off stepped down and the town council appointed me. So I basically sat through the budget season. But it is kind of weird to have somebody sit there for two months who's been elected and somebody else is voting, especially in that particular case, they'd sort of been voted off and they were still mm -hmm. voting for two months. They came. Mm -hmm. So you were there before you were appointed or you were like, you're sitting well, in the end, this person resigned and the town council acted quickly because they knew somebody had I'd already been elected to appoint me. So I was, I was sitting within two or three weeks of the election, but if that person hadn't resigned, I wouldn't have been, um, yeah, I wouldn't have been seated on the board until um, third week in June. I mean, yeah, I guess is there a cost to the delay? Like someone won't show up or like, I mean, if, if that was a feasible option to make the delay, up, you know, a law. Yeah, I guess that's my question. I don't know if it's feasible, but if it were feasible, would we like to ask if the election stays in March to not seat until June? I think so. I think, I mean, I was expecting that, like, you were expecting some time to come. Yeah, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> you watch you before you're in the book. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds like that the first ask would be June from the board school side of things because, you know, it would help turn out for the budget referendum and it would be, you know, both of those things aligned where I think it would help us get better turnout for the school referendum and um, we keep it focused on municipal elections, but I'm not sure that the town would really love that option since it's maybe not opportune timing for them when right. they are with budget. Yeah, and I, I don't know the law that well, but I believe municipal elections can't get split. Yeah, so that's my next question. No, I don't believe so. I think they'd have, they'd have, they'd have, they're going to move on. If there's, if yeah, but first, I, don't, I don't believe that you can split. The town council's already discussed this. Where, where are they leaning, you know? Uh, my, they only discussed, they didn't vote, but my sense is they were leaning towards sending it to the voters to uh, let the voters vote on whether to move it to November. I think my read was a majority favored November and a bigger majority favored leaving it up to the voters to decide. All right, I'll pass on that we have an interest in June, but recognize that may not happen and that November might be our last choice. Okay. I, I, I think the other feedback is, you know, the value, what I'm hearing, the value of keeping municipal elections separate from mm -hmm. the November election. Yeah. I mean, I think June's our first choice, March is our second, and November is our last. Yeah, okay. That's if I heard everyone. And the idea of disentangling the appointment date from the, the it's probably not, they're not interested in that, but see if they want to do that. <laughs> I mean, that would be a charter issue as well. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I don't know if I really favor it. I mean, yeah. the way you guys got elected, right, where you were unopposed. Yeah. It made a lot of sense, but you know, the way I got elected, where I had beaten somebody who'd been on the board and wasn't necessarily representing the community at that point in time, it was kind of a weird dynamic. So, plus they're tied to the town council, you said, so they'd have to willingly move theirs, which right. would make yeah. less sense. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. I, I can I can pass on what we've heard. Okay. So next up. I would make a motion to approve the slate of co-curriculars as presented. Is there a second? Second. This is a long one. If people want me to read this or are we going to wave it? It will be entered into the record. Yeah, I think this can be entered into the record as presented. Is there any uh, discussion or questions on the co-curricular nominations? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. All those in favor? Okay. Uh, so subcommittee reports, policy subcommittee met once. We started on the FF policy and the BED, I forget if it's A or H, the um, public notification policy. And Meredith and I are gonna get uh, probably a list of 10 more policies we have to fix up uh, tomorrow. Uh, UTC, have not met yet. 
Spruce. I actually got an email today asking me if I was still the representative to the Spruce Board and that we were uh, going to be having a meeting sometime in October that would uh, date to be set yet. So they're basically just emailing all the members that they had back in, you know, the end of the last school year to see if they were still members. And um, so meeting coming in October. Okay. Curriculum subcommittee, they met this week, start off meeting, going through the uh, goals and discussion of goals. And schedules. Anything you would add to that, Susan? That's we're Facilities. Uh, Meredith gave you the key update on facilities. Wellness. Uh, still scheduling, though. Or still scheduled. Although we have a tentative schedule <laughs> days I sent out. The next one would potentially be October fifth at seven thirty eight on Zoom. So we might try a morning meeting. Okay. If that works. Uh, DEI leadership is. Uh, is it this Thursday? This Thursday, the DEI leadership team will be meeting. Subcommittees have been meeting as well. Uh, strategic plan, you, you heard the main update, right? We had a good meeting last night. Um, so the next steps are a little bit of, we had a core group of four of us who were myself and Meredith and Kim Marie and, um, and Carrie who we're gonna try and take that feedback and try and work it into some uh, rough drafty kind of thing that can then start going through the strategic plan committee, which you all are part of, and then go out to the, get some more work, go out to the general public for feedback in January, and then start coming back to the strategic plan committee and the board for final approval process. Um, it occurs to me, you had it in your report, Meredith, at the fall conference as a delegate, Kind of had a little side conversation over here before the meeting started, but um, we can elect a delegate to the MESBA meeting. The MESBA meeting does a couple things. They elect um, they elect their own board, so it's like a state school board. Uh, but the the main contribution is they put together a policy document that is yes. Vibrain Mesma is Maine, uh, Maine Student Music Association. What is it actually? So there's the Maine MESBA, MSBA is the Maine School Board Association. Mm -hmm. And also Maine Student Book Award. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then there's MSSA, Maine Super School Superintendents Association, and MESBA and MESA combined together to make MSMA, the Maine School Management Association. Mm -hmm. So you. the conference is superintendents and school board members which is, I think we mentioned, you know, there are student reps who come to that. Um, but anyway, the MESBA specifically, that MESA has their own little process, but MESBA, the main thing we do is there's a policy document of positions of MESBA that is then supposed to inform, uh, there's basically a lobbyist uh, who lobbies at the state legislature. Um, I've done that about four years in a row uh it's you do a great job by the way yeah, yeah. excellent <laughs> job right <laughs> yeah, but i was telling jake and mark i don't think i'm going to do it this year it's uh saturday morning in october so i just wanted to throw that out out if anybody else is interested in doing that if not we don't have to have a representative but i did want to throw that out and we can send along the resolutions that you can look at yeah. if there's anything that beats anyone's interest sure. that you that. can be passionate about Stepping forward, maybe that would be a good way to consider it. We could still wait and do it at the next. I think we'd still have time, yeah. I mean, there's two ways you get the resolutions. One is there's a policy committee from MESBA that goes through the resolutions and um, they update it. This year, they've only, we've already seen their work. They've, they're really just fixing typos and things that like got passed in 1967 that are no longer relevant. So it's really just an update. There's nothing big that came out of the policy committee. Individual school boards can also bring forward things, and those are often really interesting because they are, you know, representing the interests of one school board uh, somewhere, and they they can be pretty radical and interesting. But we don't know what those are yet. But yeah, There's some interesting ones that have come. Oh, have there? I have well, looked. in the past. In, in the, the past, past, yes. I mean, in particular, a really controversial one was UTC, and. Um, or how they handle CTA. How they, how they fund, fund UTC. And a bunch of districts in the southern part of the state 
wanted it to be, and I forget the details, but it was going to send all the money to the southern part of the state for UTC. <laughs> Shocking. Yeah, that's a very common dynamic on this board is the southern schools and the northern schools have opposite positions on many issues. Yeah, another one was um, expanding the school day from 170 days to 180. Um, and the southern districts all wanted to do it, and the northern districts were like, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's it's an interesting, if you're interested in ed policy, it's an interesting thing to be part of. But I'll throw that out there if anybody's interested. Okay, um, any other business? Any future agenda items? Any public comment? <laughs> Seeing no public comment, our next board meeting is October 10th at 6 p.m. in the library and on Zoom. And are there any requests for information and follow-up? I would motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Passes 5 0. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> we did. It was, uh, as in, uh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. entered into the record. Yeah, I haven't been in the I haven't been in the I haven't been in the I